We're fortunate enough to have as our guest speaker tonight one of the foremost leaders in the scientific exploration of other worlds, Dr. Stephen Squires. Dr. Squires, the uh, Goldwyn Smith Professor of Astronomy in the Department of Astronomy at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Uh, he has participated in a long list of planetary exploration missions from Voyager missions as a member of the scientific imaging team in the late 1970s to his current role as principal investigator and lead scientist of NASA's Mars Exploration Rovers Program. Dr. Squires uh, participated in Magellan missions to Venus as a radar investigator, was a member of the Gamma Ray Spectrometry Flight Investigation Team for the Mars Observer Mission, and was co-investigator of the 1997 Russian mission to Mars. In addition to his current role as principal investigator for the Mars Exploration Rovers mission, he was also co-investigator for two other Martian exploration ventures, the Mars Express mission to the Mar uh, and the Mars Renaissance Orbiter's High Resolution Imaging Science Experiment. Finally, he is also uh, was a participant in the Cassini mission to Saturn as a member of the imaging team and a participant in the Mars Odyssey mission as a member of the Gamma Ray Spectrometer Flight Investigation Team. Wow. We are, we are honored to have uh, Steve here tonight to share his experiences with the Mars Exploration Rovers Program and his perspectives of the exploration of Mars. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Stephen Squires. Thank you very much. Um, my grandfather grew, uh, spent much of his life uh, not far from here in uh, Tyler, Texas. He was a, a plain spoken man and um, as I look here tonight at this, this wonderful Werner von Braun Award um, and I contemplate the idea of me receiving it. I'm reminded of something that he said to me once. He told me that if you ever see a frog sitting on top of a flagpole, you could be pretty sure he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> and um, the, the Mars Exploration Rover mission was in fact the result of an extraordinary effort by an extraordinary group of people that I feel very privileged to have been part of. So what I want to try to do tonight is, uh, very briefly for you, uh, tell you a little bit about our story, uh, introduce you briefly to a few of the people who, who made that happen, and then tell you about some of the, the, the findings from the rovers, including stuff that's just happened in the last 12 hours or so at Mars. So uh, let me start. Our mission, as I'm sure many are, of you are aware, arose from catastrophe. Uh, the Mars Climate Orbiter uh, failed at Mars, um, failed on Mars orbit insertion. Uh, only a few months later, <coughs> the Mars Polar Lander uh, failed to land successfully. Uh, the lander fell silent after its descent to the surface, and within literally days, NASA had decided that they needed to substantially revamp their Mars program. And uh, a mission that we had planned to do in 2001 was canceled, and, and my team that had been struggling for, at that point, better part of 13 or 14 years to try to get instrumentation to Mars no longer had a ride to the Martian surface. We did, however, have a lot of interesting bits and pieces lying around. We had a rover. Uh, it was not a, a piece of flight qualified hardware yet, but it was a pretty good design. We had built uh, test articles on the ground. We had a rover design that we think could do a pretty good job on the surface of Mars. We had a science payload. We had a science payload built and ready to go. I was six weeks away from having this entire science payload on the loading dock at Lockheed Martin when they pulled the plug on our mission. So we had a set of instruments. And what a lot of people had forgotten was we also had a safe way of landing on Mars. Uh, in 96 and 97, the United States flew the spectacularly successful Mars Pathfinder mission. And it landed and it got down on the surface and it, it, it uh, deployed a little rover. So there were a lot of pieces lying around. The question is, what do you do with those pieces? The idea was to take that payload, put it on a rover, reconfigure the rover so it could fit into the Pathfinder lander, 
and then send the whole shebang off to Mars. The guy who came up with that cockamamie scheme is this gentleman in, 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 here. His name is Mark Adler. He's, uh, he's an engineer at JPL. He was the one who first had the vision to take these pieces and reconfigure them and make the whole thing work. And he, he often said that, that his, his, his punishment for having come up with this idea was being put on the team that then had to actually go off and do it. Um, <clears throat> we had our problems. We had some significant problems with the development. Um, our rover was actually a little too heavy to fit into the Pathfinder lander system, and it was a little too big to fit into the Pathfinder lander system. So the rover made the lander get bigger. As the lander got bigger, the lander got heavier, and it started to get hard to land the damn thing. Um, this is some uh, stills from a video of our first uh, test of the parachute design that we thought was going to land us on Mars. This test was conducted, it was a parachute, uh, it was a helicopter drop test. It was conducted at a National Guard gunnery range outside of Boise, Idaho. It's the kind of place where you can drop big heavy things from the sky and they won't kill anybody. <laughs> and um, we dropped the test article, it blossomed, it made this perfect orange and white bowl, and then the parachute just exploded. It just ripped to ribbons. And parachute after parachute after parachute uh, failed. We didn't actually have our first successful parachute test in the big wind tunnel up at Ames until eight months before we had to be on top of the rocket in Florida. It was a terrifying development. The guy who pulled it off was this gentleman here. Sort of looks like Elvis with that haircut. His name is Adam Stelzner. Uh, Adam looks a little stressed in that picture because this particular picture was taken right during the height of the, uh, the parachute uh, failures. Uh, but uh, he was the one, he never designed a parachute in his life. But he was the mechanical lead for our entry, descent, and landing team, and the, the, the job fell to him, and, and, and he managed to do it. Then there were the airbags. Now, we got a lot of engineers in the audience, so I'm, if you look at the looks on their faces, you had days like this, right? Okay. <laughs> um, this is from our first airbag test. Again, we thought we would use the, uh, the airbags that had been used on, on Mars Pathfinder, but again, our vehicle had become too heavy and we had to go through substantial redesign. And the problem was it wasn't just an airbag problem. You could make the airbag stronger. It was easy to, easy to make them stronger, but you had to make them heavier in the process. And you start making your system heavier, all of a sudden you got a system problem, not, a, not, a, not just an airbag problem. Well, we solved the airbag problem. This is one of, our, one, of our, uh, one of our early tests of the airbags that actually worked. The guy who did all of that, really the one who was the systems engineer who led the overall problem of how do you land this thing on Mars, was Rob Manning. Rob Manning was one of the originators of the, uh, the Mars Pathfinder design, and he was the one who really came through with, with a way of getting this whole thing to get down on the surface of Mars. Now once you get down on the surface, this whole crazy thing has to then do origami in reverse. <laughs> to turn itself into a rover. I mean, that's our little rover. Fold it all up inside of this thing. And there are so many gears and motors and springs and hinges and latches that have to work exactly right for this thing to turn itself into a rover. Um, I mean, watch this process now. These, these gold things that are folding out, those are the solar cells. Those are the life-giving solar arrays. If those things don't fold out and deploy during the first day on Mars, you don't survive the first night on Mars. The mast has to come up, the antenna has to come out, all of these things have to work in the first two and a half hours on the Martian surface or you don't have a mission. This thing was a mechanical nightmare. The, uh, the mechanical genius who led the entire mechanical team for the rover was a guy named Randy Lindemann. Randy deserves credit for a lot of things, but one of the things he deserves the most credit for is the fact that spirit and opportunity are still alive today after 1,200 sols on the, on the Martian surface. Okay, what Randy realized... <laughs> what Randy realized, and I didn't have to explain this to him, was that our legacy from this mission was going to be directly related to how long these things lasted. That was going to be related to how big the solar panels were. And what he went through to come up with that crazy unfolding scheme for the solar panels to make sure that we had a solar array area that we would survive long enough on the surface was phenomenal. And we owe a lot of the lifetime of this mission to him. He had ways of making us very nervous, though. Watch this. There's a jack underneath the vehicle. And watch what the front wheels do. <laughs> I still get the heebie-jeebies watching that. You know, if those latches don't latch, you're done. But uh, it all worked. Now, after Randy came up with this, 
we naively thought that once we got to this configuration, we were home free. The rover's standing up, the wheels are out, all we got to do is cut the cable, go monster trucking down off the, the, the land and onto the Martian surface, and everything would be good. And then we did some tests. <laughs> um, so this was another bad day. It, it turns out that when you drive one of these landers off of the rover, it can turn itself upside down. And so people had to get creative again. The solution to that one was to build these ramps. There are these fabric ramps between the pedals of the lander. And as the lander opens out its pedals, the ramp, which is made of the same fabric as the airbag material, um, snaps into place. The, the guy behind that and many, many other things in what we called the process of impact through egress, the process of getting the rover off of the lander, was this gentleman here, Joel uh, Krzyzewski. Joel looks kind of tired in that picture. Uh, this, this picture was actually taken at the end of a long day of testing in our indoor, you see the red Martian soil on the, on the ground there. We had this Mars test facility at JPL, and Joel was sitting there wondering if this is ever going to work, but it did. So we built them. We put them together. Everything fit. That was nice. Uh, and then we loaded them into some big uh, van line trucks, and we shipped them off to California. And then as you do after a long trip, you got to unpack. Uh, we unpacked all the hardware, and boy, there were a lot of pieces. You got two rovers, you got two landers, you got two crew stages, you got two aeroshells, you got dozens of engineers working on putting these things together, and the schedule is starting to get impossibly tight. It was getting really, really tough. The rovers had to be fully checked out, lots and lots of test tests. This was a, a three-ring circus to try to get all these things done at the Cape and get us out on top of the rockets on time. The, the ringmaster of that circus was Matt Wallace. Uh, the process of putting a spacecraft together, shooting it off, is what we call ATLO, Assembly Test and Launch Operations. And Matt was our ATLO lead. And he was the master of playing this game of chess with all these pieces on his chessboard. And if it wasn't for Matt, we, there's no way we would have gotten these things to the, to the launch pad on time. We did. We, uh, we put them all together took him out to the launch pad. I drove out 2 o'clock in the morning at 3 miles an hour behind that truck as we took it out to the pad. Um, Delta II is a pretty launch vehicle. It's uh, sort of delicate looking from a distance. You get up close, it's kind of a brute, actually. Uh, we hauled those things up to the top, and uh, this is the final checkout. This is the night before uh, we, uh, we made our first launch attempt with Spirit. This was our last chance to, to kind of say goodbye to these vehicles. We uh, stood back and uh, let uh, Boeing and the Air Force do their thing. And uh, off they went. Launching these was a strange feeling for many of us on the team. You know, we, I had always had this naive idea that launch was just going to be this joyous moment where years of work would finally come to fruition. In reality, at least my feelings that day were very, very different. It was hard to say goodbye to these things. I mean, it sounds stupid, but I still miss them. Um, we had become so tightly attached to these vehicles. I mean, I, I know they're robots, okay. But, <laughs> but, but we had become so deeply attached to these things that, man, you put something on top of a rocket and you shoot it off to Mars, it's really gone. And uh, that, was, that was hard to deal with. Now, a lot of people who didn't really understand the space business very well, after we launched them, would come up to me and say, well, now you can relax, right? You got seven months to unwind before they get to Mars. <laughs> well, no, actually. Um, we, we launched these vehicles without really the slightest clue how to operate them. In fact, the software for driving them, now the, the software for launch cruise and landing, that was done, that was tested, we knew it worked. The software for driving hadn't even been fully written yet when we launched these things. The beautiful thing about software is you can launch the hardware and then you can launch the software months later after you finish it. <laughs> and so five months into our seven month cruise, we sent the, the driving software up there. Um, we had seven months basically to, to earn our Martian driver's licenses. And we had a series of tests fueled by many boxes of pizza, as you see there. Uh, that, that taught us at least the basics of how to operate these fiendishly complicated machines. Landing night came, and it was, um, it was a nervous time. We lost contact with the vehicles, uh, and then we got it back. And it was a real, real good moment. You know, it's funny, a lot of people have talked to me about, about the scene in the control room that night. Everybody's jumping up and down and yelling and screaming and crying, and I was doing that too. 
And they contrasted that to the AOK -okay mission control kind of way they do things in Houston. I said, well, what, what is it with you guys? And my answer has always been that we had a lot of things in the control room that night, but one thing we didn't have was control. <laughs> Mars is 10 light minutes away. We were spectators just like you guys on television. We had no way of controlling anything, and so we were just enjoying the show like everybody else was. Um, we got down on the surface, but for me it wasn't over yet because I still had all of those Randy Lindemann and, and Joel Krzyzewski magical steps that had to work. And for me, it wasn't really going to begin until we had six wheels in the dirt at Gusev Crater. On Sol 12, that happened. And that was one of the best moments of my life, pr producing the predictable reaction. <laughs> that, was a, that was a good feeling. So then we were off to the races. Then we were ready to go off and, and explore and do science. Well, it lasted for 18 blissful days before the sky fell in. Um, what, it, what happened, it turns out, was that there was an incompatibility between the commercial software package that we had purchased to manage the flash file system on our rovers and the operating system. And it turns out you have to send an awful lot of commands to this vehicle before you run into that particular glitch. And we had never run a test that operated for 18 continuous SOLs worth of operations. But on SOL 18, we hit that problem and we lost communications with our vehicle. Now this was three days before opportunity was due to, be, to, was due to land on Mars. We had no idea if the opportunity landing was gonna work. Uh, Spirit had, for all intents and purposes, died as far as we could tell. And we had no idea if the thing was, gonna, was ever gonna come back to us. The problem was solved by two brilliant software engineers at JPL. That's Glenn Reeves at the top and Tracy Nielsen at the bottom. Glenn was our lead software architect. Tracy was the, uh, the designer of our fault protection software. And they were able from tiny, tiny fragments of data, literally just crumbs of data, were able to intuit out what was going on on Mars and figure out how to fix the problem. They saved the mission. Those two people saved the Spirit mission. This picture is one of my favorites from the entire mission. Doesn't look like much. But that's the first picture that came back down after the SOL 18 anomaly had been solved by, uh, by Glenn and Tracy. And it, it was, this, 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 this image will always have special meaning to me. And then this happened. 24 hours after we got <laughs> Spirit back, we had our remarkable landing at, uh, at uh, the Meridiani landing site with Opportunity. You've probably seen this before. The images that you see here are ones that were taken by the, by the vehicle as it descended towards the surface. That little black dot to the left of the big crater is the shadow of the parachute. And the red curve shows the trajectory that the spacecraft followed. We come screaming in from space. We drop the airbags. The wind, which is blowing from the south, causes the trajectory to bend to the north. Bounce, 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 bounce. Reading the green pre perfectly, it bends to the left and goes right into a 20 meter impact crater. Now, I believe in giving credit where credit is due. I don't know who to credit for this one, so <laughs> I will, will simply invoke the spirit of Tiger Woods and move on. And we looked around, and uh, man, there was a spectacular outcrop of layered bedrock seven meters away from the vehicle. It was the luckiest night of my life. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our, our adventures uh, once we got onto the surface. This is the first rock that we looked at with Spirit. We named it Adirondack. It's this tall. Um, we hit this thing with everything that we had, hoping to find out that it was some kind of layered sedimentary rock. And no, it turns out it's a piece of lava. And everything else around it was a piece of lava, too. And what that meant was that Mars had kind of faked us out. We went to our landing site with Spirit looking for layered sedimentary rocks, and that wasn't the geology. Um, however, Mars presented us with a wonderful opportunity. Two and a half kilometers away, now remember these are rovers that are designed to last for 90 days and drive 600 meters, but two and a half kilometers away was this spectacular range of hills called the Columbia Hills. And after realizing our predicament, we thought, well, maybe there's something good over there. So we drove there, arriving at the base of the hills on day 156 of our 90-day mission. And uh, we were starting to get tired by this point. Um, and this is what we were presented with. This is Husband Hill. It's named after Rick Husband, who, who of course was the commander of the Columbia when it went down. And we climbed Husband Hill. 
On the way up, we started to find the kind of stuff we'd come looking for. We started to find layered rocks. We started to find minerals that could only form as the result of the, of the interaction of, of water with these rocks. We ascended all the way to the summit of Husband Hill, arriving at the top on, on day 583 of the mission. You can get a sense of scale from the uh, Statue of Liberty there of what a big climb this was. Here's a picture from the summit. This was the view that we had as we surveyed the scene around us from the top, you know, having completed the first mountaineering expedition on Mars. As we speak right now, Spirit is at the location of that white arrow, exploring a, uh, a plateau that we have named Home Plate. Um, we had a tough time through all of this. Uh, Mars is a dusty place, but fortunately, Randy Linderman had built the solar arrays and designed them to be big enough that they could withstand a lot of dust buildup and the rover could still work. When this vehicle was fresh off the showroom floor on Sol 1 at Gusev Crater, those solar arrays, which you see here, and this is self-portrait, by the way, taken of the, of the rover uh, by itself at, on Sol 330. When it was straight off the showroom floor, that vehicle put out 900 watt hours of power per Sol, enough electricity to run a 100 watt light bulb for nine hours. That power level went down and down and down and down, and by the time this picture was taken, it was down to 350 watt hours. And we think that death is somewhere around 250. So spirit was close to the end. And then, of course, one wonderful day, literally overnight, this happened. <laughs> a lucky gust of wind hit the vehicle, and the power went back up to 850 watt hours. Um, <laughs> just, just pure dumb luck. It was, it was as if this had happened, actually. It was, uh, <laughs> somebody just sent me this picture the other day. I thought that was, I, I, just, I just love that. Um, after 1,200 sols, uh, just about a week and a half, two weeks ago, Spirit made a, a remarkable discovery. Um, one of the problems that we've developed on this vehicle is that the right front wheel does not turn anymore. And so we have to drive backwards and drag that wheel. And that's, that's, that's rough. It's a, it's a tough way to drive. Um, but what we have discovered is that as you drive, it digs a wonderful trench as you move along. And sometimes interesting things will pop up in that trench. Um, this patch of soil popped up uh, a few weeks ago. We thought it looked interesting. We went over and we measured its composition with our alpha particle x-ray spectrometer. This is the actual IPXS data that came down about a week and a half ago. And that red peak there is the element silica. This stuff, this bright white soil, is 90% pure silica. 90% pure SiO2. We are calling the little valley that we're in now Silica Valley. <laughs> um, this, is, this is the kind of stuff that you, you need to have water to make that kind of concentration of silica. We're thinking about hot springs. We're thinking about fumaroles. But something very, very interesting happened here. And we discovered this after 1,200 days on the Martian surface. It really makes me wonder what else is out there. Uh, this picture came down about 12 hours ago. Um, this is actually one of the nicest images from our navigation camera. I've seen the whole mission, I think. We've now climbed up onto that home plate plateau. You can see Husband Hill in the background there on the skyline where we were on the summit, uh, gosh, 700 sols ago or something. And uh, in the foreground is just one of the most beautiful outcrops I have ever laid eyes on. So we're, we're working on this one as we speak. Then there was opportunity. Uh, with that remarkable landing in Eagle Crater. I won't tell you the whole story of all the science that we got there. You probably know a lot of it well. There was the hematite, the blueberries, the remarkable bedrock that's made largely of sulfate salts, uh, the little ripples that are, that are preserved in the rock from water flowing across the surface here long ago. It was a remarkable 60 days in, in a crater considerably smaller than the size of this room. Uh, we left there and we went to a much larger crater, um, Endurance Crater. This was a remarkable experience as well. This one was 150 meters in diameter, 20 meters deep. Uh, we drove down into it. And as we did, we worked our way down those layered rocks and we put together the first stratigraphic section uh, ever done on another, on another planet. This, I think, remains one of the signature accomplishments of the mission. We uh, spent about 300 days, I guess, in the crater. We left the crater, came out. The next place we went was our heat shield. This was an interesting experience. The heat shield, of course, falls off the vehicle by design during the descent, smacked into the surface going about uh, 200 miles an hour, broke into pieces. And we went over to look at it, not to learn about Mars, but to learn about heat shields. 
course, engineers have been tasked with the job of trying to design a heat shield that will work in the Martian atmosphere for decades, but until our mission, no one had ever actually had the privilege of seeing their creation after it had done its job. We were able to go over, take a cross section through it uh, with our microscope and hand that to the engineer who designed the thing. Now, of course, being good scientists, at the same time we were looking at the heat shield, we were also looking around for rocks. We found that one in the upper right. We named it heat shield rock. Um, and it turns out that's not a rock at all. Uh, we found out that that's actually made of a nickel iron alloy. It's an iron meteorite that just happened to be sitting there right next to the heat shield. I told the team we shouldn't stay here. This is obviously the place where big metal objects fall from the sky. <laughs> um, we drove south for long distance at very high speed until one terrible day we got stuck. We got our priceless rover stuck in a sand dune, buried over the hubcaps. Now, I know a lot of you deal with NASA. If you ever want to get NASA headquarters' attention, getting a $400 million vehicle stuck in a sand dune, that'll do it. <laughs> um, we, were, we were in trouble. We didn't know how to get the vehicle out. Now, you know, the first rule in a situation like this is don't do anything dumb. Don't think it's going to make the, make the problem worse. And so what we did was to try to learn more about it, we decided to get one of our earthbound rovers similarly stuck and then figure out how to get it out. The two guys who got stuck with leading that task are these gentlemen here, Rob Sullivan on the left and Jeff Bizadecki on the right. Rob's on my science team. He's a soil physical properties expert. Uh, Jeff is one of our lead rover drivers. And Rob came up with, the first thing he had to do was come up with a recipe for Martian soil. Okay, now if you ever need to make fake Martian soil, here's how you do it. You need equal parts play sand, the stuff that you use in kids' sandboxes, clay, and diatomaceous earth, the stuff that you use in swimming pool filters. So we came up with that recipe, and then Jeff and a bunch of JPL engineers fanned out across the LA basin in pickup trucks and bought literally tons of this stuff. People were getting algae in their swimming pools across Los Angeles all summer long. <laughs> because we bought all the diatomaceous soil. And they mixed it up and, and, and literally, you know, tons of this stuff and made pits and mounds and, and drove the rover in and got it stuck. And then these guys spent two and a half weeks rehearsing techniques to try to find the optimal way to extract a robot from a sand dune on another planet. There are lots of things you can do. You could drive the wheels at different velocities, you can rock the vehicle, and so forth. And after two and a half weeks, they finally found the optimal technique. Turns out the optimal technique was to put it in reverse and gun it. Um, you know, there's no place you go to look this stuff up. So here we are gunning it, uh, churning our way laboriously through this horrible sand. There's our left rear wheel. I mean, we were really buried. We had to command 192 meters worth of wheel turns to drive one meter on Mars. But uh, one wonderful Saturday morning, we popped out of the feature that we later came to call Purgatory Dune. <laughs> and we've been treating the dunes with much greater respect ever since. But again, you look at guys like, like Robin and Jeff, and they saved Opportunity's mission by figuring out how to do that. We drove uh, south as far as we could until we got to this spectacular feature here, the Geologic Promised Land. This is Victoria Crater. This is 800 meters in diameter, 70 meters deep. It's just a geologic history book. And luckily for us, we arrived at the rim of this thing at the same time that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter with, it, with its spectacular high-rise camera arrived at Mars. Um, so here's a picture. This is taken by high-rise of uh, Victoria Crater. We'll zoom in on one area there, and that's opportunity. In fact, if you look carefully, you can still see, you can see the shadow of the camera mast on the Martian surface. It was real nice to see our rover again. It's, it's a spectacular camera, and we're using these vehicles in tandem now, using the, the orbital images to, to plan the rover traverses. It's, uh, and then, in fact, we've, we've been recently doing an experiment where we're looking for dust devils at Gusev Crater where we'll simultaneously take pictures with pan cam on the rover and high rise overhead of the same scene and try to catch dust devils in the act from two different angles. It's, it's kind of cool. 
This shows our drive around the portion of the rim of Victoria Crater. We drove all the way around to that place that we named Tierra del Fuego because that was, that was the end of the line. That was where we chose to, to turn around, and we have since turned around. Uh, just to give you one example of the kind of geology that we're seeing in the crater walls, this is a place called Cape St. Mary. We'll zoom in on this portion right here. Now look at that. Absolutely spectacular geology. If, if I told you that this was... Uh, you know, the Navajo sandstone in Zion National Park, uh, you would probably believe me. And you know, geologists, when they take pictures like this, they like to put something in it for scale, so there's my virtual rock hammer. <laughs> I wish that were my real rock hammer. Um, we have turned around. We finished our partial traverse around Victoria Crater. We have left Tierra del Fuego. We're heading back now towards Duck Bay, which is the place where we first entered the crater. That bright yellow arrow that you see at the very top there, that's the, that's the drive that I helped plan yesterday from my hotel room here in the, uh, in, in the hotel. That was the reason I wasn't in any of yesterday's sessions, was I was upstairs doing that. Um, and here's a picture that, whoop, there it is. Here's a picture that just came down. You can see lots of, lots of rover tracks around here. This has been a, a busy vehicle. So our adventure continues, and we hope to, uh, to travel to Duck Bay and uh, if a careful safety review indicates that it's safe to go in, we're going to go in, we're going to do a lot of good science, and then we're going to come out again and keep exploring. Um, I'd like to finish my remarks here tonight by saying a few brief words in praise of NASA. Um, it's easy to uh, complain about NASA, and believe me, I do it a lot. Um, and NASA is deserving a lot of criticism that it gets. But I view the Mars Exploration Rover Project as one of NASA's finest hours. Um, make no question about it, this was a NASA operation. Um, the vehicles were paid for with NASA money. The critical decisions were made at NASA headquarters. The idea of flying two vehicles instead of one originated with the NASA administrator. And as I look to the future, I try to, I take some comfort from the fact that the same agency that put Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon nearly 40 years ago put spirit and opportunity on Mars less than four years ago. And that gives me a lot of hope for the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Um, please stay up here for a moment, if you will. What, what a terrific speech. We are so fortunate to have people like Steve working on planetary exploration of these distant worlds to bring them into the homes and minds of people everywhere. I and mean, it's just a, such a terrific blessing to have that available to us. Um, Tonight we want to honor you for the work that you've shown as leader uh, of the team associated with the Martian Rover uh, program. And uh, it just so happens we prepared a little video to uh, commemorate this occasion. Computer. Welcome 
to all who seek the new frontier. Please don't stop. considered to be the father of the United States space program. His brilliance and rocket technology helped forge the wings of fire that continue to transport us into the beckoning unknown. excellence in leadership and management of a significant and successful space-related project. The award is determined by majority vote of the NSS Awards Committee. The winner is acknowledged as an outstanding proponent of Dr. Von Braun's aspiration to not only explore the moon and Mars, but to move from old frontiers to new as we venture far from our earthly cradle. Our special guest speaker tonight, Dr. Stephen Squires, was born in 1957 and is a professor of astronomy at Cornell University. He received his PhD degree from Cornell in 1982 and won the H.C. Urey Prize from the American Astronomical Society in 1987. This year, he was awarded the Benjamin Franklin Medal from the Franklin Institute. Dr. Squires is the principal investigator the Mars Exploration Rovers, the two intrepid robots which captured the attention of the world when they landed successfully on Mars in early 2004. Squires Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, continue to explore the secrets of the Red Planet today and amazing three years later. His well-known research in planetary science has helped propel us to the next level of discovery. It is with great pleasure that we present our 2007 Werner Von Braun Memorial Award winner, Dr. Stephen Squires. Wait, would you like to say a few words about the Von Braun Award? He's going to present. Do you want to say a few words about it? I've come later. Okay. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Squires, recipient of this year's Winner Von Braun Memorial Award. I think that's definitely what my grandfather had in mind when he was talking to me about frogs and flagpoles. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Fred Ordway 
is a man who came up with the idea for this award. So he will come up here and, and share his thoughts and reflections on Dr. Winter Von Braun and this award. Everybody, Fred Ordway. So Steve, Steve, there's a few add-ons to the main award, which uh, we do. And uh, I'd like to present you, first of all, with a Werner Von Braun Memorial Award 2007, which is a boxed edition of the Stuhlinger Ordway biography of Werner Von Braun, two volumes. So that's for your odd moments when you can relax and read a bit. Uh, and that, uh, I have a, uh, a letter from Ernst Stuhlinger, my co-author, who couldn't be here tonight. Dr. Stuhlinger was uh, uh, Werner Von Braun's basically chief, of, uh, chief scientist. He ran the uh, Space Science Lab and Space Science Division, various things from beginning in the early days all the way through. He's a Pinamunda, and he was very regretful. He's up in the mid-90s now, so he couldn't make it here. Uh, sec secondly, uh, we did a, a Verna von Braun biography on the Discovery Channel uh, a number of years ago. Uh, John Hendricks uh, was a good close friend of mine agreed very readily that we should do that, and we did it. Uh, and John Hendricks has given you today a DVD version of He Conquered Space, uh, Werner von Braun biography. This uh, was, incidentally, was given a, a theatrical uh, a premiere in Huntsville uh, with uh, Walter Cronkite as the Master of Ceremonies. So it's a nice film when you get a chance to look at it. It's about 50 minutes long, or a little room for the ads. <laughs> and this, this, has, this is not an official piece, but I have to add that personally. Uh, this is a book that I wrote a number of years ago, and it, uh, it features a lot of the illustrations uh, depicting Verna von Braun's 1950s, early 1950s visions of a manned mission to Mars, they called it in those days. He didn't really think about your kind of uh, uh, mission at all. And uh, the, the front cover of this is a, one of the Chesley Bonestell's visions uh, depicting Ver, Verna von Braun's ideas, also of uh, Fred Freeman, the space artist, uh, uh, two space uh, uh, artists. So I think you'll enjoy that in your Thank spare you. moments. I wanted to say a few uh, words uh, in addition. Uh, uh, Steve has written in a marvelous book, uh, which I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. And he, a couple of things that really attracted my attention. One was that he stressed in his book the importance of developing a team, something that Verna von Braun did. We all heard about the Verna, Verna von Braun rocket team. Uh, Steve has done the same thing. And he took uh, time to list in the appendix of his book, Roving Mars, over 4,000 names of his team members in creating the marvelous uh, uh, a triumphs of, of spirit and opportunity, which I think is something very, very unusual and very, very uh, marvelous to think and very wonderful. Also, he stressed in his book the importance of working, close working relationships between the science community and the engineering community. Scientists can come up with the beautiful ideas, engineers have to make it possible. And he worked very, very hard in de developing a very close relationship between these two disciplines. Uh, also, uh, he, we, he didn't mention today that he, he fought hard over many, many years in the wake of the lots of sad things going on on Mars, the failure of Mars, auto, of Mars, the Mars Observer, the Mars Polar Orbiter, uh, the Mars Polar Lander, and the Mars Climate Orbiter. All doing that, those were shadows over the program. But he persevered, and finally we have the great triumphs uh, of the Mars Exploration Rover Program, and I think we should also give him a very, very hearty uh, applause for the marvelous work he has done. Once again, thank you, Dr. Spars. Quite, quite an accomplishment. You know, it is a real honor to MC a banquet where the Winner Von Braun Award is given, especially when you're from Huntsville, Alabama. <laughs> well, now we're going to turn our attention to the Space Pioneer Awards, and, and our president, Kirby Yakin, and I will work together in presenting these. So, 
bear with me here a little bit. So the, the Space Pioneer Awards recognize those individuals and teams whose accomplishments have helped open the space frontier. The awards are divided into a number of categories such as media, space business, legislator, engineer scientist, and space activists of the year. The intent is to recognize those who have made significant contributions in the different fields of endeavor to develop a spacefaring civilization which will establish communities beyond the Earth. We do think long range. The award itself uh, is a rendering of the moon in pewter, created by the noted uh, artist Don Davis and produced at the uh, Baker Foundry in Placerville, California. The moon may not be, the, it first seemed to be the appropriate choice for, for, uh, to represent the spirit of the space pioneer, um, but however, the choice of the moon does become clear when we consider that almost any project for long-term settlement and development of space require that we use the moon in some way. The award is given to recognize the pioneer in spirit, not just uh, in those who wish to hear and see and, and talk about what's over the next hill, but it's for those who strive to make what, what's over the next hill uh, a place where people have the opportunity to go and make a lives for themselves. Tonight, the first recipient of the Space Pioneer Award for 2007 is an individual who has worked in the support of space exploration and development for more than 30 years. Dr. Kenneth Cox is an engineer and a scientist and a futurist who has used his uh, considerable talents to make the vision of a spacefaring civilization a reality. His experience spans a lifetime, uh, beginning with the Apollo program in the early 1960s uh, when he uh, served as a technical engineer for, for the primary uh, digital flight uh, control systems up until the uh, present day when he leads the uh, Aerospace Technology Working Group a uh, group chartered uh, by NASA to fulfill the vision of providing, get this, vision and leadership for the evolving and growing uh, vital and thriving human presence in aerospace and uh, astronautics to stimulate industry, education, and science and, and inspire scientific achievements in development of exploration. That's quite a charge. <laughs> Earlier this week, the Aerospace Technology Working Group at Wiggins is affectionately known, by the way, under the leadership of Dr. Cox, met here in Dallas uh, in conjunction with our ISDC, a, a cooperative relationship which we hope to extend into the future. Dr. Cox has endeavored uh, his entire professional life to hasten the day when space settlement is possible, and for this vision and his outstanding continuing efforts uh, to support of space development, the National Space Society is honored to present Dr. Cox with the Space Pioneer Award in space development category. Um, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Cox and, and congratulating him for winning this award. Dr. Cox. Well, thank you. First of all, what do I have? One minute? Two minutes? You've got to tell me what's appropriate here. Well, don't spend all night. <laughs> okay. What, what, what I want to do is just share the, some, some high points and not keep it too long. Number one, uh, on Apollo, it's important to understand that I helped bring the information age from dead scratch into the space program. What happened was the Mercury system was an analog system, the uh, Gemini was an analog system, the initial uh, planning for um, going back to the moon was analog, and in midway we said let's go to digital. So we had to develop, and I was responsible, for the digital flight control, the digital guidance, navigation, and control for something that had never before been accomplished in flight. And subsequent to Apollo, the same thing happened again with the present shuttle, where we had a digital control system and we had to build it for ascent, put another software load in there and build it for on orbit, put another software load in there and have entry. There were three different programs and we had to meld together this whole idea of are you gonna be a spacecraft, are you gonna be a booster, are you gonna be an entry, whatever, all had to be put into the same piece. Now, I'm not gonna talk any more about the shuttle except to say that uh, having been successful, it, it required 
a lot of system integration, as you might suspect, okay? And that was, that was fun. Now, back to Apollo. Um, I, I want to emphasize, as we struggle and talk about where we are with NASA today, Apollo was not just a NASA program. And so when we say NASA did this project for so much money in Apollo and why can't we do it today, that misses the fact that there was tremendous number of military people and educational people that came and worked on Apollo not because they worked with a NASA badge, but they were part of this country's attempt to, to, to enter into this new strategy. And when Apollo was over, they left. They didn't come just to join a government organization, which is kind of unique, and I'm not sure everybody realizes that. Um, Let's see, um, I, I've, I've done a lot of oral histories and um, uh, appreciate uh, the fact that I, that I work with Dave uh, Christensen with, with a lot of the uh, oral histories done at Marshall and, and uh, I wish he was here as a matter of fact. Um, and I, I, I've got a lot of stories to tell but one thing I'd like to point out, and I think it's important. See, I could ask the question, how many students are there in the audience today? And I suspect there's not very many. But when Apollo was over, those of us that had this unique opportunity and to say, well, you know, it's one thing to redesign the, the refrigerator that, that this is the 49th version. It's another to have something like this that says you've got to make it work and it's never been done before. So how you do it? So you forget all of this, who's wearing what badge and, and, and so forth. But the main point was when Apollo was over, I and a lot of other people were faced with a very fundamental question, what the hell do you do the rest of your life? <laughs> and I approached it like I wasn't gonna be like Bruce Springsteen in glory days where the high school football jocks sit around at age 35 in the beer, t beer hall talking about the good old days in high school football. I said, I am not going to relive all of this. I want to move forward. So all of us were faced with that sort of process called, you're never going to get another job like that. So I do think as a result of that, I made the conscious choice that says, it's just like the Native Americans or all sorts of indigenous cultures. It says the elders of the tribe have a responsibility to pass the wisdom on to the next generation. And I think that is such a fundamental principle and we all should be practicing that at this time. And how, whether it's the National Space Society or uh, a government agency or whatever, that, that symbolism involved in passing on what you know as best you are from where you come from to the next generation is extremely important and that's one of the things that I just have an absolute ball doing these days. So thank you. Ken is a great guy. Uh, his work with Atwig is an inspiration to all of us. I've spoke at the Atwig myself Wednesday morning. Actually, I got to be the first speaker for some strange reason, probably because I was the number one sucker of the day. I don't know. <laughs> and I spoke to them when they were in Huntsville a few years ago, and that's when I realized this group uh, has got a lot of kindred spirit with our National Space Society. And they tend to be people a little more experienced than some of us. And I, I can say to Ken and the rest of that, we, we can use all the wisdom you've got to pass to us. Thank you, Ken. Our next Space Pioneer Award uh, is one for the Special Merit category. And it goes to an individual who has also spent his entire professional life in support of space development and exploration 
in this case with a specific effort on behalf of the lunar base development and human settlement of the moon. Now, that's kind of dear and near to a few of us. Professor Heinz Hermann Cullen began his interest in aerospace as a pilot during World War II. And then he went on to receive his PhD in Berlin and came to America as a member of the Dr. Winner von Braun's team in Huntsville, Alabama during the early years of the American Space Program. After becoming an American citizen, he returned to the Technical University in Berlin to a career of professional space technology. He has served as a dean of the Department of Transportation at the university as a member of the International Academy of Astronautics and the chairman of the Subcommittee on Lunar Development. Professor Culler has over uh, 300 publications and most of them dealing with the development of lunar bases and settlements and in the uh, coordinate and he's also been the coordinating editor of the uh, Lunar Base Quarterly and really stays with it. Professor Culler is one of the uh, foremost experts on human settlement and uh, development. He has inspired uh, and, ed and educated several generations of space engineers and space scientists ensuring future space uh, generations for, for space development. For those reasons, uh, he and his lifetime of efforts uh, furthering the goals of human settlement space and the National Space Society uh, is honored to, to award Professor Cole the Space Pioneer and Special Merit category and we'll present to him this later in the year at B Berlin because he just can't be here with us tonight. Um, we do have a gentleman who wants to say a few words on, on his behalf. Uh, Fred, would you like to come back up and, and say a few things? Herman, Kur Herman Kurler was one of what they call the second generation of Germans who came over uh, looking upon Werner von Braun as sort of a Pied Piper. Uh, he came over after World War II. He wasn't a Peinemunde. Uh, his deputy was a man named Harry Kurler, uh, who became, they both became very close friends of mine when I worked in Huntsville during those days. Uh, other Germans of his uh, 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 generation came over, Jesko von Putkam, who still works at NASA uh, headquarters. Uh, his main interest in those days uh, was the moon. However, under uh, uh, Professor Curley's uh, leadership at the, uh, first at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency and later uh, 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 Huntsville, they had a number of programs. One was the Horizon program, uh, which was an Army, all Army based uh, study uh, that looked upon the moon as the high ground. And uh, the Army had proposed uh, that the Army uh, launch, using the von Braun team, missile to the moon. Uh, they would set up a, a missile base there. Um, if the Russians should uh, attack the United States, they could always uh, attack Russia. I mean, one of those strange studies. Uh, but the main thing that er Kurla did uh, was to lead a study called Empire. Now, some of you know have heard about Empire, early man, planetary, interplanetary uh, uh, return uh, 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 expeditions. And he looked at those uh, studies were made looking upon a missions going in the 1970s, uh, which would do go to Mars with a boost from the planet Venus, uh, not land on the Mars, but do a, a flyby of Mars. Uh, and a whole series of these, I won't go into details on those, um, uh, but he, he was very interested in Mars uh, way back in those days, and since our recipient uh, of the uh, uh, Mars Exploration Ro Rover Program is here tonight, I thought I'd mention those details about Herman Curley, and I'll, I'll be glad, I wrote a, a long technical paper on that, which I'm gonna send you. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Fred will be uh, receiving the award for, for Dr. Carter tonight. Fred? Oh, okay, well, fine. I'll, 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 I'll get it to you. We'll be presented to him later in Berlin. Now I'd like to turn the, the microphone over to Mark Hopkins, Senior Vice President of the National Space Society, where he will present the uh, National e Excellence Awards and the Space Activist of the Year Award. Mark? Uh, 
hiding this one. I am greatly honored to present the National Space Society's Awards for Excellence for Outstanding Service to Society. These awards go to activists, and activists are the lifeblood of the National Space Society. They're also the lifeblood of the movement, the space movement. The goal of the National Space Society is the settlement of space and the use of the vast resources of space for the betterment of humanity. According to Michael Griffin, as an administrator, and I quote, the single overarching goal of human spaceflight is a human settlement of the solar system. No greater purpose is possible. We in the National Space Society have been sitting, saying this for over 30 years, and we certainly agree with Michael Griffin. If you're interested in becoming one of our volunteers, and we're always looking for more volunteers, you can simply Google the National Space Society and go to our website and follow the obvious links. Tonight, the awards I'll be presenting are all surprise awards, and that means that none of the people who are going to receive these awards know it as of this minute. These awards, the winners were selected by our awards committee, and one of the rules we have is the members of the awards committee are not eligible. And those <laughs> members, uh, for sort of obvious reasons, but anyway, those members are myself, Larry Ahern, Greg Allison, Margaret Jordan, O.T. Lipak, Fred Ordway, Candace Pencannon, John Strickland, and Lynn Zielinski. Two criteria are important for receiving these awards. One is the level of service, particularly in the last year. And secondly, we try to spread these awards around a little bit. And so if you got the award in the previous year, it's much more difficult to get it the next year. In the history of NSS, only a few people have ever gotten an award for two years in a row. Our first award winner is a former chapters president. He has been active in chapters for almost two decades. He is a data space specialist with an MS in computer science and cur current chair of the 2008 Space Settlement Calendar Committee. Now, calendar committee doesn't, doesn't really sound like all that much, but let me explain to you what this calendar committee really means. There haven't been any significant space vi uh, visuals concerning space settlements since the late 1970s. And yet, there's a tremendous demand for those visuals today because our concept of space settlement is spreading rapidly throughout society, thanks to people like Michael Griffin, Mark Berger, the uh, President's Science Advisor that said nice things about it, and for that matter, Stephen Hawkins. So, in order to do a calendar, we need space visuals. So what the calendar committee did is they held an art contest. And the art contest generated over 70 of these visuals, 12 of which will be used for the calendar, and the rest will be used for a large number of other items, the things which the National Space Society is interested in, <laughs> such as publications uh, in our magazine at Astra. But why is art important? The answer here is that if you look at the history of movements and what movements have been successful in the past, such as the anti-slavery movement, or more recently, the uh, environmental movement, there are certain characteristics which uh, people who study these things, academics, have seen. And one of these things is that movements are successful in changing the direction of society and really making a difference, which is, of course, what we want to do, is that they appeal not only to the intellectual side of decision-making process in humans, but also to the emotional side. They appeal to the heart, the, the soul, as well as the brain. And one of the best ways of doing this is art. And therefore, I'm giving this first award to the chairman of the Space Counter Co Committee for 2008, Jim Plaxco. next award goes to an individual who is a senior research associate uh, for, for human factors at NASA Ames, where he's been for over 25 years. 
He has over 45 technical papers, 11 awards from NASA of a group and individual nature, and a winner of the Feynman Prize uh, for Nanotechnology, and he's chair of our Space Settlement Advocacy Committee, which has been our most active and uh, most exciting committee during the last year under his tutelage. Two of the things, and I'll just name two, that, that this committee did was one, they negotiated a Space Act agreement between NASA and the National Space Society, which brought in, which took the Space Settlement Design Contest for students, which had been the NASA Ames Space Settlement Design Contest, and under the new agreement is the NSS NASA Space Settlement Design Contest, and made it part of, made it part of us. As part of that agreement, we are responsible for publishing, publicizing the uh, contest, which has been going on for 13 years under NASA. This is a contest where the awards are, the award winners are chosen by a team at NASA Ames, and they get uh, considerable recognition at NASA Ames and at NASA publications. But what we are adding, in addition to publicity, is uh, we are providing an award at the ISDC for the winning students, and we did that last Friday. The second thing that this committee did was they created what is the Space Settlement Nexus. What that is, is an area on our website, and you can get that by Googling NSS, going to our website, and hitting Space Settlement at the top toolbar, is a collection of almost all the information that one can reasonably easily get uh, concerning space settlements. It's now over 8,000 pages and still growing. So if you're interested in space settlements, that's the place to go. It is the biggest and best place on the, on the net to obtain information about space settlement. This individual is Al Globus. <laughs> Al can't be with us tonight because of serious illness on the part of his wife, so accepting his award on his behalf will be Anita Gale, who is co-chair of the other Space Settlement Design Contest, uh, which we are getting an increasingly cooperative relationship with. award, and there's only four of them, so this is the third. This one goes to a self-sized, a self-described technological entrepreneur, a former chapter president, a former space back chapters coordinator. He's chaired an ISDC in the past. Uh, he's chair of the NSS Conference Coordinating Committee uh, for the last five years. This in the, the Conference Coordinating Committee is the committee to which all of our conferences uh, report to, including this one. Typically, there's about three ISDCs in various stages uh, reporting to that uh, committee at once. In addition, he is chair of the Archives Committee of NSS. Now, I think that's is actually the most important thing he does, is this Archives Committee. And let me explain why. Na uh, our, our favorite NASA administrator, Michael Griffin, has said, one day there will be more humans living off Earth than on it. Okay. Ask the question, what will historians be interested in when this is true, when most humans are living in space settlements rather than on the Earth? And the answer is, obviously, they're going to be very interested in how space settlement came about. They'll be interested in the beginnings of space settlement, who were the people that generated the ideas for space settlement, who, what were the organizations, like I said, that pushed space settlement in the early days, who were the leaders of those organizations, etc. So we're compiling all this information to facilitate the work of historians in the future. And our thought is, as a consequence, at least a partial consequence, a lot of the people in this room will end up being in the history books. Dale Eamon, please come forward. Now, 
next award, now remember I told you in the beginning that nobody had ever gotten two of these awards, more than two of these awards in two consecutive years. Well, for the first time in history, we have a three-time winner who's getting this award for three consecutive years. And that's because of the incredible dedication of this particular individual. This individual is a systems aerospace engineer with a master's degree, highly intelligent, once was a uh, national, scholar, national merit scholar, and as I pointed out, extremely dedicated. This individual does four jobs for the National Space Society, all very well. Each of these jobs would consume the entire passion and all the energy and time of a very dedicated activist. These four positions are secretary, editor of Downlink, our online publication, editor of Ad Astra Online, the publication we do in conjunction with Space.com, and he'll be chair of next year's conference in Washington, D.C. So please have a hand for our first three-time winner, Josh Powers. come to the last award for the evening. This is our premier Activist Award. It's called the uh, Chris Pancrantz Activist of the Year Award. And there's a story about why it's named Chris Pancrantz after him. Chris was CEO of the National Space Society during a particularly rough period when we didn't have an executive director. He's worked full time. This is, he didn't have any other job. He's working full time for NSS, which means like 90 hours a week. Uh, and for over a year. And then we found out towards the end of this year that Chris was dying of cancer. Chris Pancras chose to spend the last year of his life dedicated to NSS and to our goals and to his personal goal of space settlement. Deeply moved, the National Space Society Board of Directors renamed this award after him and also through a number of donations of individual board members raised a fund to send some, his, some of his ashes into space, which happened a couple of months ago. He flew with over 200 people, including Gordon Cooper and the actor who played Scotty in Star Trek. The primary, re the pri the, the primary qualification for receiving this award, well, it's partly because of the importance of the service. But the real reason is because of deep dedication to the society and its goals. So, in the spirit of Chris Pancratz, tonight's awards winner is a person who is a senior analyst at Northrop Grumman, a professor at Georgetown University, almost 15 years of dedicated service at the Rand Corporation, where she handled mainly space issues, has published numerous books, not kind of articles, just the books, that are used in universities and defense colleges around the world. She was a longtime chair of the awards committee and of course was ineligible, but then fortunately, and would have gotten this award otherwise uh, several years earlier. But she left the awards committee as chair a few months ago, and so now we can give her this award. <laughs> this individual, besides spending long hours for a number of years as the chair of the awards committee, not to mention various other activities for this society, also paid out of her own funds and a series of donations, the majority of the, of the cost of the awards for the last several years. This individual is Dr. Dana Johnson. Please come forward. Thank you very much. This is quite an honor, totally unexpected, and thank you, Mark, and thank you to everybody on the awards committee and to all the great support that I had when I was awards committee chair. And this is a true honor, and I really appreciate it very much. Thank you all very much. Sorry.
deserve that, Dana. And everybody else. Well, in our, <clears throat> excuse me, in our last award tonight, I'd like to invite uh, Paula Goodlett, who's the managing editor of uh, Jim Bain's Universe, uh, to the podium to, to make the uh, James Patrick Bain uh, Memorial Writing Contest Award. Uh, Paula? There you are. I not think a writing contest would have very much to do about the space program, but we're talking science fiction here. <laughs> so all of our people uh, who write, most of them are very dedicated to the, to the idea of moving out to space. Jim, Jim Bain was the publisher of Bain Books. He died 28 days after the magazine that bears his name went to its first publication. So we're very pleased that NSS has asked us to co-sponsor this writing contest. The third place award this year is for the story Acclimate, I can't pronounce this. Yeah, that one. <laughs> Which happens to be a story about colonizing Mars by Michael A. McPherson. Our second place story was Anniversary by Robert Billing. And the first place story about space travel a Better Sense of Direction by Mike Wood. Thank you. Well, I've, asked, I've, been, I've been asked to say just a few words about the awards committee. As you know, Dana Johnson chaired it for years and kept us all together and things moved along real smoothly. Uh, I'd like to thank the members of, of the committee, uh, now chaired by Margaret Jordan, uh, other members like Mark Hopkins, who was up here presenting the surprise, the fun surprise awards for tonight. Larry Earhart, Lynn Zelensky, Candace Panakin, Ati Lipak, myself, George Whitesides, and especially Fred Orway and John Strickland for all the work and tremendous effort they put into things like this uh, Winter Von Braun Award. Um, I want to thank uh, Michael Hall of the uh, Studio Foundry in Driftwood, Texas, who built the Von Braun Award and the uh, award bases too, which also uh, go along with the uh, Space Pioneer Awards. And um, so uh, that, that's a new addition. We got them all made on pretty much the same basis. I thought somebody from Alabama could read. Could read. <laughs> and um, let's see. Well, we have some announcements I want to make here to kind of get things going here. Um, First, I'd like to say that, um, you know, we're a society that's here to make a difference. We don't come here just, just to, to, to hear talks and nod our heads and shake our hands and clap. Although that's fun, and we do that, and that's good to show our appreciation, but we're here for a purpose. And um, there are many ways to express that purpose. Uh, many of you are out doing your own corporations, pursuing your own dreams. Some of us are working at the activist level, doing chapters. And, the things that got all these awards tonight. Well, we have another little activity coming up here in just a few weeks that will give you an opportunity to express that purpose just a little bit more. Uh, we're having what we call uh, Moon Mars Blitz in Washington, D.C. I see a few people out there who have been with me on a few of these things. It's going to be the 10th, 11th, and 12th of June. And we're going to go up to the halls of Congress and, and we're going to uh, lobby for the future. And uh, we've done it several times before. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we've got some really good appointments made up for this. I'll, there's like 100 or some odd appointments. I'm going to rattle off just oh, maybe 10 or so names here out of that set just to give you an idea of uh, some of the flavor of people we're going to be talking to. It's mostly uh, appropriations committees and the likes leads So these are key, uh, and members. These are some of the key people who are going to make a difference in the upcoming budget this year, such as uh, Representative Bud Kramer, uh, Representative Ralph Hall, who was here a few days ago, Senator Trent Lott, uh, and we got Representative Chet Edwards, uh, Representative, he's from Texas, let's see, now here's a funny one. I hope this guy's pro space because his name is Zach Space. I hope we can sell space to space. Don't really know him, but I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> well, we got Nick Lampson, some of you guys know him. Jesse Jackson, Jr., we got an appointment with his staff. Arlen Spector, 
and Bill Nelson, who's been around, uh, been around the world a few times on the shuttle, and uh, a presidential candidate staffer, Hillary Clinton. Uh, we have in the past talked to Obama himself and quite a few other people. So it's, it's a very interesting event. It's a lot of fun. Uh, another announcement is that uh, there are DVDs being made uh, of all these uh, talks that we've had here. And the gentleman just come up and mentioned that to me a moment ago, said that if you give me five minutes, I'll have them outside the door here. So hopefully when we uh, get out of here, he'll be close to having those assembled. And then I say what's going to be the most fun for the night, for the last, and, uh, and that's that we're having a reception hosted by the ISDC for 2008 in Washington, D.C. next year, immediately after this dinner, which means right now. I want to say this for last because I want you to hear my, my blitz stuff before you split out of here. And uh, this is going to be a hub party, and it's in the room called the Legala, which is directly across from the bar downstairs. So it's, uh, you know, pretty much a happy hour party kind of thing. Good place to network and get to know each other better and formulate, conspire to do great things. And that's what I'd like to see you doing. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Good night. <laughs>